Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. This time around, I'm going to give you a first look review at the new Nikon Z mount 600mm f4. When Nikon asked me to take this lens for a test drive, I was really excited. The thing is, in the past, I've often wondered why Primes never had a built in TC since lenses like the 180 to 400 and the Canon 200 to 400 did. So I was cautiously optimistic when the Z mount 400 2A came out with a built in TC, mostly because I was really hoping that Nikon would do the same with the 600 millimeter, and thankfully, that was the case. Also, note this lens is exclusively for the Z series cameras, not for DSLRs. However, before we begin, I do need to mention that everything you're about to see and hear in this video was based on a pre-production lens, so there may be slight differences when the finalized version is out. This also means I wasn't able to conduct my normal battery of tests or provide full-size images for your review. Instead, you'll find there are a lot of field impressions in this video, which actually, who knows, that might be better. Either way, I hope to do a supplemental review once I get some time with a production copy, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. For this quick field test, we drove down to Florida and met up with the Nikon rep. I only had access to the lens for about a day and a half, and 90% of that time was under clear skies with harsh sunlight that made wildlife photography more than a little difficult. Still, I was able to pump quite a few photos through the lens, and although the light wasn't ideal, it was still a great way to get a feel for the lens's capabilities, and I'm happy to share what I learned with you in this video. Finally, before we begin, I want to mention that although Nikon asked me to try the lens, I insisted that the travel expenses were mine. As always, I want to remain neutral so I continue to pay my own way for any and all reviews you see from me. So with all that in mind, let's jump in. Build and Features as a surprise to no one, this lens is a top-line pro optic and has the look, feel, and ruggedness you'd expect from a professional-level Nikon lens. I have little doubt that this can stand up to the rigors of daily abuse that I am sure to inflict upon my copy of the lens. I would have no fear of taking this lens out in just about any condition and anywhere on the planet. It's fully weather sealed and actually includes Nikon's fluorine coating to help repel troublesome drizzle, droplets, and dust. I can't wait to take it to Africa, the tropics, and everywhere else that demands rugged, dependable gear. The lens comes in at 14% lighter than the 600 f4e, weighing just 3,260 grams or 7.2 pounds. For comparison, the Nikon 600 f4e was 8.4 pounds, the Sony 600 f4 is 6.7 pounds, and the Canon 600 RF is 6.9 pounds. So the new lens is 1.2 pounds lighter than its predecessor, and within a half pound of the competition, but also has a built-in TC that they don't, and that's a huge benefit, as we'll discuss later. However, the big story, at least for me, is how well balanced it is. Another topic we'll cover in just a bit. The lens is 165 millimeter or 6.54 inches wide, basically the same as the 600 f4e. It's 437 millimeter or 17.3 inches long. Despite the built-in TC, this is only slightly longer than the f-mount 600 f4e, which is 432 millimeters or 17 inches long. The new hood is also noticeably shorter than the one on the 600 f4e and makes placing the lens into my Guri Gear Kabuku 30L with the hood attached, incredibly easy. With the 600 f4e, I always had to take the hood off, so I am thrilled that the new lens fits so well. It seems like it was designed with air travel in mind. Oh, and the carbon fiber hood attaches with a traditional thumb screw, although this one seems better quality than the one on my 600 f4e. The lens controls themselves have a durable, solid feel to them. Like other Nikon Z series telephotos, VR and focus distance recall are controlled in camera. As I've mentioned in the past, I think this is superior to a jumble of switches covering the lens barrel since you can turn options on and off without looking from the viewfinder. The side of the lens still has a couple of switches though, one for switching between auto and manual focus, and of course, the range limiter. The range limiter allows you to use either the entire focus range of the lens or limit the focus range to between infinity and 10 meters. This can cut acquisition time down if the camera misses a lock and starts to hunt since it can only take that hunting trip through a limited area of the focus range. Unfortunately, the range limiter does not include a short range option to help with closer targets. The lens features an FN1 button, a ring of FN2 buttons, as well as a memory set button all of which have an extensive list of functions you can program them to perform. Also, note that the four function buttons around the front 
all act as the FN2 button, not four individual programmable buttons. The focus ring is, as you'd expect, incredibly smooth and well dampened. The lens also features a control ring and function ring, both of which are programmable through the camera. I think when I get mine, I'll end up setting my control ring for ISO adjustment and the function ring to increase and decrease exposure compensation. Or vice versa, that decision will take a little bit more time to decide. The lens has 26 elements and 20 groups, as well as an alphabet soup of acronyms to help deliver the best possible image to your sensor. It includes two fluorite coated elements, one short wave refractive glass element, two extra low dispersion glass elements, and one super extra low dispersion glass element. It has a nano crystal coat, a mesoamorphous coat, and a fluorine coat. You can look up the specifics for what these are and what they do on Nikon's website, but long story short, they are cutting edge optical technologies that help deliver crisp images free from defects and aberrations, as well as providing fantastic flare resistance, and that's certainly what I experienced with this lens. The lens has a typical minimum focus distance for a 600 millimeter of 4.3 meters or 14.11 feet, resulting in a reproduction ratio of 0.14x. The cool thing is that TCs maintain minimum focus distance, so with the built-in 1.4 TC engaged, your minimum focus distance stays the same and your reproduction ratio goes to 0.2x. The upshot is that if you're working on a small, close-range target that's not quite filling the frame, a quick flip of the TC will remedy the situation. The lens also uses a clever 46mm drop-in rear filter that eliminates that annoying knob that was on top of the old 600mm lens. It's easy to engage and features a handy directional indicator. Although I seldom use polarizers with long glass due to the two-stop loss in light transmission, I'm confident some shooters will find it handy. Finally, the lens collar and foot. The collar rotation is buttery smooth and the locking knob is textured nicely and has a good feel to it. Oh, and the locking knob also includes a Kensington lock under the little removable cover. The foot is pretty much standard issue and has a nice feel to it with a little padding that makes it a little bit more comfortable to carry. However, I'm sure I'll end up replacing it with a dedicated Arca Swiss foot as soon as one becomes available. Built-in TC. As I mentioned earlier, one feature I was hoping this lens would have is the built-in 1.4 TC, so I'm really thrilled to see it. Just a quick flick of the finger engages and disengages it. The operation is smooth and fast, and it stays in place without issue. There is a lock option if you're worried about it getting knocked out of position, but in my time with the lens, I didn't find that an issue. With the TC engaged, the 600 f4 becomes an 840mm f5.6. It's basically like attaching an external 1.4 TC just without the extra steps. Of course, when you engage a TC, there's always a concern about losing a little bit of acuity and sharpness. However, it certainly seems negligible with this lens. Although I'm sure there is a small difference in quality with the TC engaged, I'm really not seeing it from the shots I took in the field. Just look at these 100% crops of this in Hinga, one at 600 millimeter and one at 840 millimeter. Both show a stunning amount of detail. I imagine a more formal bench test might reveal a difference, but from a practical field standpoint, the TC seems pretty invisible to me. The only way I can really tell the difference between 600mm and 840mm with my preliminary images is by checking the EXIF data. So yeah, I'm impressed. One thing I discovered in a hurry is that having a built-in TC with a 600 f4 is definitely a game changer for me. Probably 90% or more of my wildlife work is done at either 600 millimeter or 840 millimeter. I live in the focal ranges that this lens provides. It didn't take much time using this optic to see what an impact it would have by allowing me to switch between my two most commonly used focal lengths instantly. The thing is, this is far more than just an easy way to engage a TC. It changes the way you use the TC. Traditionally, you decide if you needed a TC or not for a given scenario, and then you were sort of stuck at that focal length. If you had targets at two different distances, you basically had to pick the distance you thought was the most promising and just kind of live with it. Sure, you could take the TC on or off, but trying to simultaneously shoot animals at the 600 and 840 millimeter range was problematic to say the least. Oh, and forget the idea of putting a TC on or taking one off partway through an action sequence. With this lens, changing from one distance to another becomes not only realistic, but nearly instant. One flip of the lever and you can change focal length to quickly jump from one distance to another. Not only did I use this lens to change from one subject to another at different ranges, I also used it a few times during an action sequence when the subject got either too near or too far at my current focal range. 
in many cases, this lens effectively doubled the number of potential targets I could shoot. I can't wait to get my copy of this lens and put it through its paces. There are so many times I've missed shots because I either needed the TC, needed to take it off, or I was in the midst of changing it. All that hassle is gone now. As a bonus, it also takes indecision out of the equation. After all, how many times have we all deliberated if we needed a TC or not? With this lens, just flip back and forth as needed. Also, if you're new to action photography, you can also use this TC to help you get on target. Often when using an 840 millimeter lens, it's challenging for newer shooters to get on target with that really narrow field of view. With this lens, you can start at 600 millimeter and once you get on your target, flip to 840 millimeter. Oh, and get this, the lens also supports both the 1.4 and 2X Z-series TCs with or without its own TC engaged. To demo this, I did a quick video on the Atomos so you can get an idea of how versatile this lens is. First, this is just 600 millimeter, no TCs at all. Now I'll engage the lens's TC and jump to 840 millimeter. Not bad, but still not quite there. Now I'll add my 1.4 Z-series TC to get in even closer, 1,176 millimeter. Now, just for fun, let's jump to DX mode. Wow, it really gets in there with an effective field of view of a 1,764 millimeter lens. And again, this also supports the 2X TC that, with the lens's own 1.4 TC engaged, would bring it to 1,680 millimeters in FX and give a 2,520 millimeter effective field of view in DX mode. Sadly, I don't own a 2X at the moment or I would have shown you that too, but I think you get the idea. One thing I did notice is that with an external 1.4 TC attached and the lens's own TC engaged, AF does seem to struggle a bit for action work, so use with caution. As for quality with external TCs added, I honestly didn't test that combo enough to really draw any conclusions. There honestly just wasn't enough time to do everything. From what I saw though, the images do seem to hold a good level of sharpness. This is another one of those items for our longer term supplemental review. Before we go on, I wanted to mention that I've just published a new book, The Ultimate Nikon Z9 Setup and Shooting Guide for Wildlife Photography. The book covers how I set each of my menus for wildlife work, why I set them the way I do, and how I leverage those settings in the field. If you feel like you're not getting the most from your Z9 setup, or if you find yourself overwhelmed with the menus, this book will come to the rescue with easy to understand language and tons of examples. Check it out, it's a must have for every Z9 shooter. I'll put a link for it in the card above and in the description area for this video. Autofocus, VR, sharpness, and rendering impressions. Since the lens I was using was a pre-production model, I wasn't allowed to comparatively test things like AF speed, VR performance, sharpness, or background rendering against other glass. However, I am allowed to pass along my impressions. So that'll have to do for now. Later, once I have my production copy, I'm planning a follow-up to this first look review that will include more detailed information. First, AF speed, and that's an easy one. It's quick enough to make a race car jealous. This lens uses Nikon Silky Swift VCM AF drive and it's incredibly fast. In fact, my seat of the pants estimate is that it's easily one of the fastest long lenses I've ever used. Even when starting from minimum focus distance, it zipped out to infinity fast enough to drop my jaw. The AF drive was quick, snappy, and really inspired confidence. Normally, I use the focus limiter quite a bit with burden flight work to save focus hunting time when the camera or I miss the target. It didn't even occur to me to touch the limiter during our tests. Focus is that potent. In addition, I found focus with this lens is incredibly accurate. If the AF point is on target, it's going to be sharp, period. How about VR? Nikon claims 5.5 stops of VR performance with this lens on a Z9 and 5 stops on a regular Z-series camera. The difference is because the Z9 has a more sophisticated IVA system. Full disclosure, I've never been able to get the claimed results from Nikon or any manufacturer. However, this lens was impressive. Due to the bright conditions and tight schedule, VR testing was very limited, but I did manage to play with it early in the morning. I was easily able to knock out sharp images at 1 200th of a second handheld with the TC engaged. In fact, based on the number of shots I was able to pull off at that shutter speed, I'm confident that I could have dropped even lower, but sadly my test target took off and we didn't find another good target until it got much brighter. So this is something I'll have to look at with a longer term test. Still, my preliminary results are looking good. Next, sharpness. Normally, I like to compare lenses against other known good performers, but since this was a pre-production unit, that wasn't possible. However, 
Based on the images I captured, this lens seems more than comparable to Nikon's other big primes. The photos I captured showed impressive sharpness and detail that matches or exceeds the hundreds of thousands of sharp images I've captured with exotic primes over the years. I could easily see every bump on the skin around the orbital rings of the bird's eyes. I could make out reflections and eyeballs and feather detail was terrific. And this applies regardless of whether I use the TC or not. Across the board sharpness was outstanding and even when the bird's head was towards the edge of the frame, it was still bitingly sharp. Basically, it's everything you'd expect from a high-end exotic prime. Background and foreground rendering look great with nice smooth transitions from sharp to blurry across the board with and without the TC engaged. I didn't spot any oddities in the way the backgrounds rendered, even with VR on, and overall I liked the dimensional feel of the images. Even in harsh light, the lens did a good job at taming busier backgrounds. This lens certainly seems at least as good as my 600 f4e, and probably better. If you love smooth, silky transitions and soft, sometimes dreamy looking backgrounds, this lens delivers. Handling and ergonomics. So how's the lens handle in the field? In my opinion, really well. Let's look at some specifics. Although it's not a featherweight, it's still 1.2 pounds lighter than the 600 f4e. However, what really makes a difference is how well balanced it is. The balance is more towards the camera and makes the lens feel a bit lighter than the 7.2 pound weight might suggest. For the most part, I handheld this lens the entire time and it was fine. In my opinion, this lens is far easier to handhold and manage than the 600 f4e was. Of course, we're all different when it comes to handholding a lens of this size, so your mileage may vary. Still, there were times I found myself thinking about grabbing a tripod or monopod, usually when I was on a subject and waiting for it to do something like turn, fly, pose, etc. Although I find the lens very hand-holdable, I wouldn't want to hold it for a long period of time, and I would grab some sort of support if I thought that scenario was in my future. Another thing I like that falls under the handling and ergonomics category are the rotating lens controls. Each of the rotatable controls has a different texture, making it easy to move from one to the next by feel. No need to take your eye from the viewfinder. I'm glad to see Nikon doing this on their longer glass. It makes finding the control you need and adjusting it very fast and intuitive. However, I would also say that these controls are easier to slide between when you're on a tripod than when you're hand holding. I found that while the lens is well balanced, Trying to maneuver my supporting hand around on the lens to find the control I wanted was awkward at times since I usually liked my supporting hand a bit more forward than the control locations. Still, it seldom affected my ability to knock out shots and I believe I'd likely get used to it over time. I found the rest of the switches and buttons easy to locate once I became accustomed to the lens and I could pretty much operate everything without removing my eye from the viewfinder. Should you get one? As you've guessed by now, this is a premium lens and it comes with a premium price tag. The retail for the lens in the US is $15,499 and will start shipping late November 2022. If you're a wildlife photographer and have the budget, this is simply a must have. For me, my 600 millimeter is my bread and butter lens and my primary income earner. For me, as a working pro, this lens is a no-brainer. The ability to easily engage a TC and jump back and forth between 600 and 840 millimeter is absolutely going to have a positive impact on my keeper rate. However, it's admittedly a much tougher choice for hobbyists. If you're in the market for a 600 F4, I think this lens does deserve some serious consideration, despite the, gee, I could get a used car for that kind of price. The thing is, this lens allows you to do things that just aren't possible with a normal 600 F4 thanks to the built-in TC. It also offers native Z-mount controls that simply aren't available with legacy primes like the 600 F4e. If you're a hobbyist wildlife photographer with the budget to pull it off, I think this lens is a great way to go. One question that I'm sure is going to come up is, if you have the money for this lens, what about the 400 to 8 TC? The thing is, there's a lot of ground to cover when it comes to the whole 400 to 8 versus 600 F4 debate, and I'll probably make a video down the road that goes into far more detail than what we can do here. For this review, I'll keep it simple, since one of the primary benefits, maybe the biggest benefit of these lenses is the built-in TC, I think you need to base your decision on the focal ranges you use the most. And I think you can take it one step further by just looking at how much you use 400 millimeter versus 840 millimeter, since both the lenses can get you into that middle range of 560 or 600 millimeter. So that makes it simple. If you find you're at 840 millimeter more than 400 millimeter, then the 600 F4 is the way to go. 
Now, if the opposite is true, then the 4028 is the lens for you. Again, this is an oversimplification, and I know there are weight and size differences among other factors. I also know you can add TCs to the 4028, but again, the idea with these lenses is to minimize the time spent hassling with TCs, so you should make your decision based on that idea. For me, it's a no-brainer. I shoot far more at 840 millimeter than I do at 400 millimeter, so it's not even close. Conclusion. As you can tell, I think Nikon has a winner here. The versatility of the built-in TC just can't be underestimated. Although I only used the lens for a very short time, it was instantly apparent that it has really changed the game in this focal range. To have instant access to both 600mm and 840mm will absolutely make a noticeable difference in the number of in-range targets you can photograph and will absolutely increase your keeper rates. The days of missed shots because you needed, didn't need, or were changing a TC are finally over. On top of that, the lens is amazingly sharp with and without the TC, is well balanced, has amazing VR, and in my opinion, is hand holdable in many, if not most, situations. Plus, it even fits into my bag, and very likely most airline size bags as well. Overall, I'm impressed and I can't wait to grab a copy and start shooting. Again, remember to take a peek at that Z9 setup guide I mentioned earlier. If you want to get the most from your Z9 setup or just want to see how I have mine set up, this book is the way to go. And you know what? The book has already helped a ton of people. I hope you'll check it out. Also, make sure you stop by the site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss a video, article, or announcement. As always, I'd love it if you'd like, subscribe, and get notified. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.